because one month with Christ, one day with Christ, one minute with Christ is better than a lifetime without Him. We have the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus, and we have it in earthen vessels, in ourselves. The center of religion is not about my sacrifice, but His sacrifice. The essence of the gospel is not primarily about what you give up. It's about what Jesus gave up. Those who have been redeemed and rescued by the power of His love are more precious to the Redeemer than Himself. The struggle itself is a sign of life. Keep getting up. Father in heaven, we come before you this evening. Already you have ministered to us through the preliminaries. Father, as, as we have listened to the testimonies, as we've pondered the seminars and the ones that we're planning on attending, or better yet, the one you want us to attend, as we have heard the testimony of those that are working with the open door and the upcoming evangelistic meeting, and Father, even as we have seen this humble trailer, you have ministered to us, you have shown us tonight that you are a real God that is alive in a real, active, powerful, dynamic way. And so, Father, we are asking tonight that you will do something marvelous and something supernatural. We're asking that as we open this book, this ancient book, this important book, that you will perform a supernatural spiritual transaction and that you will send your spirit not just into this room in a general sense, but that you will send your spirit into hearts. And that your spirit will take this message and tailor make it to the exact needs of every person in attendance. Father, tonight, give us a rich experience with you. We want to know you. We want to see you. And we want to see Jesus. So as we open this book, this special book, this important book, this inspired book, we're asking that you will open our hearts. In the wonderful, mighty, powerful, glorious name of Jesus, let all of God's living saints say, Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 3, verse 10. What we're going to do is we're going to begin by looking at three biblical vignettes that are very, very similar in one significant respect. We're in Luke chapter 3. What chapter, everyone? Luke chapter 3. John the baptizer is preaching. We'll pick it up in verse 4. Luke chapter 3 and verse 4. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Verse 7, Then he said to the multitudes, John speaking, that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these very stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and is thrown into the fire. John the Baptist is preaching with power. He's preaching with conviction. He's preaching with a sense of certainty. And as the multitudes were going out to see this strangely clad man standing up to his waist in the muddy waters of the River Jordan, the crowds were going out. Some of the religious leaders of the day were interested in John's influence, and they wanted to go out to also see what all of the fuss was about, and perhaps even to capitalize on some of his popularity. And so apparently on, on one occasion, there's John and he's preaching. He says, don't, don't begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. And he's preaching away. And there are people there, Pharisees, religious leaders, scribes and others, standing on the banks of the River Jordan. And John must have directed his attention to these when he said, brood of vipers, who told you to come here? I can imagine them saying, did he just call us a herd of snakes? Don't even begin to say, don't even think about saying within yourselves that we have Abraham as our father. Surely he's not talking to us. If God wanted to, he could raise up children unto Abraham from these very stones. And even now, he says, the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is thrown into the fire. 
Have you ever heard one of those sermons that you felt was preached just for you? Say amen if that's true. You're thinking to yourself, I cannot believe the pastor is airing my dirty laundry in front of all these people. Right? The pastor is preaching, and, and all of a sudden you have this sense, this, this resolute sense that God is speaking right to you and that the pastor has written the whole sermon just for you. Beloved, that's not the pastor. That's the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's one of the great things about the foolishness of preaching. I mean, there is no way even the most gifted orator, even the most gifted speaker could not tailor make a message that would meet the needs and, and idiosyncrasies of every single person in this room. So there, there is a supernatural element to the preaching of God's holy word. Can you say amen? amen? We have to remember this, by the way. Preaching is not entertainment. In fact, I like to tell people, never get to the place where you enjoy listening to a sermon. If it is something that, that you enjoy in the entertainment sense, this is not a good situation. You should listen to a sermon saying this, not, I hope the preacher does a good job, not, oh, I really like this guy. This is one of my favorite preachers. You should be thinking, God, speak. Amen. Amen. Speak to me in your own inimitable way so that I know you are speaking. So you've had one of those experiences. I've had it. When God is speaking right to you and you know it. Some element of your life you suddenly find to be is out of harmony with God's revealed will and the preacher through the foolishness of preaching is able to put his finger, better yet the finger of the Holy Spirit, right on that area of your life and you think to yourself, I need to make reform, I need to make change, I'm not living right in every area, I need to straighten up in some aspect. If you're hearing what I'm saying, say amen. amen. Okay, now that's the Holy Spirit, so there's no point in getting mad at the preacher, someone else say amen. Okay, so here we go. I, right? i got to cover my tracks. So the Spirit of God is speaking, and clearly that's what's happening here on the banks of the River Jordan. I mean, the Spirit of God is speaking right through John. John is speaking right to the point, right to the issue. He was a fearless man. He said, don't begin to say to yourselves, and he goes through the whole thing. The axe is laid to the root of the tree, and those people know at that moment with crystal clarity, God is speaking to them. Their life is out of harmony with God's revealed will. Now, more often than not, I'm going to hazard a guess that when you have the experience of hearing one of those sermons that you feel like was written and composed just for you, your response goes something like this. You say to yourself, that preacher's right, that pastor's right, better yet, the Bible is right, and I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to what, everyone? Is, is that sort of what happens in the mind, yes or no? Okay, so you think, hmm, you know, maybe I really shouldn't be doing X, Y, Z. And you know what? I'm going to do something about it by the grace of God. Th this, this response, this reaction is something that is built into the very fiber and fabric of us as human beings. Now, you're still there in Luke chapter 3. Now, look at verse 10. John is preaching his heart out. Look at the response of the people. We're in what verse, everyone? Verse 10, so the people asked him, saying, what shall we do then? That's the immediate response. John is preaching. They're under conviction. They realize their life is out of harmony with God's revealed will. And their immediate response, the knee-jerk reaction is, what do we do? Well, obviously what they're saying is, what do we do in order to make it right? Is that clear, everyone? Yes or no? What do we do in order to remedy the situation? What do we do to make this situation right? Okay? Now open your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. That's the first scriptural vignette. We go from Luke through John to Acts, Acts chapter 9. When you get there, feel free to say amen. Acts chapter 9. Now here in Acts chapter 9, we find the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Okay? I'm beginning in verse 1. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, they were not yet called Christians, they were simply referred to as the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He was looking for letters of permission. Verse 3. 
As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Just stop for a moment. Get the picture in your mind. It's not a difficult one to grasp. Saul is on his way to Damascus, and he has permission that if he finds any of these crazy, radical, fanatic people who are associated with Jesus of Nazareth, he can take them, men and women, bind them and bring them back to Jerusalem. And so he's going, and suddenly a bright light shines around him, and he falls to the ground. Now, he, he has a sense that he is in the immediate presence of God. He doesn't know exactly who that God is, but he knows it's divine because he says, Who are you, Lord? Who are you, what, everyone? But he knows he's in the presence of God. Who are you, Lord? Now, it would be an understatement of significant proportions to say that Saul of Tarsus was totally unprepared for the answer to that question. Are you with me, yes or no? See, think of it this way. He thinks that if he finds followers of Jesus and he arrests them and puts them in prison, he thinks he's really doing God a service. He thinks that that's what God would want him to do. What he's about ready to find in a moment is that the very people that he was willing to imprison are actually followers of this God, Jesus. Totally unprepared. Who are you, Lord? Now, here's the equivalent of this. Imagine with me, I'm driving on my way here down to Southern. I'm driving down I-75 there, and uh, suddenly somewhere in Kentucky, a bright light shines on the interstate, and we pull over the Honda Odyssey, and I have a sense that I'm in the immediate presence of God, and there's a bright light, and I can't see anything, and I, I say, who are you, Lord? Why are you persecuting me? Who are you? And then there's this silence, and the answer comes back, I am the Pope. Okay, would that be revolutionary for me? Yeah, I, I'd say, who? So I am the, I say, no. <laughs> really? Uh, sorry about all those evangelistic sermons. <laughs> right? Now, 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 let me be clear on something. We know that's not going to happen, but the point is, is that just as radical as that would be was Saul's experience. Just as radical. Who are you, Lord? Look at the response in your Bible. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. I guarantee you that Saul thought to himself in that moment, you have got to be kidding me. Who? I am Jesus. I'm Jesus of Nazareth. I'm the one that these people that you're going to throw in prison and bind, bound, uh, bound and bring to Jerusalem, I'm the guy. I'm him. I'm Jesus. I'm God. I'm real. I'm your Savior. Now, Saul suddenly has the realization that what he thought was the will of God was in fact not the will of God, and he realizes that his life is radically out of harmony with God's revealed will. Are we all clear on that? Yes or no? I mean, his whole world has instantaneously, in one nanosecond, been turned upside down. Notice, what is his knee-jerk response? What's the first thing he says? Let's take a look at it. We're there in verse 6. So he trembling and astonished. That's another way of saying he was beside himself. Couldn't believe it. So he trembling and astonished said, reading from the New King James Version, Lord... What, would, what do you want me to uh, do? Isn't that interesting? That is the very same thing that the people who are standing there on the banks of the River Jordan when John the Baptist was preaching his heart out and those people realized that their life was radically out of harmony with God's revealed will, their immediate visceral knee-jerk reaction was, what do we do? Hey, so to hear with Saul. So too here with Saul. Saul realizes that his life is radically out of harmony with God's revealed will. His whole world is turned upside down in a moment. And the first thing he says is, what do I do? Well, obviously what he's saying is, what do I do to make it what? Right. 
Acts chapter 2, third vignette. Go with me if you would to Acts chapter 2. Peter's preaching. It's the day of Pentecost. It's what day, everyone? Day of Pentecost. Peter's preaching his heart out. And he's, he's coming to the, to the close of this marvelous, uh, well-architectured message that he's putting together piece by piece, point by point, quoting from the Old Testament, quoting from the Psalms, and he's bringing it all together. And in verse 36, the word therefore occurs. Does everyone see that? Yes or no? Verse 36, therefore. Now, when you see the word therefore in the Bible, ask yourself, what's that therefore? Right? We need to learn how to read the Bible intelligently. Can you say amen? amen? Hey, you can read five chapters, but if you don't understand what you read, what good did it do you? We need to learn how to think when we're reading. Amen? And so, so you see there in verse 36, therefore, in other words, this is the conclusion. That's what the word therefore means. Point number one, point number two, point number three, point number four. Therefore, here's my conclusion. Peter's been preaching his heart out, preaching his guts out. The Holy Spirit has fallen, and he says, therefore... Let all the house of Israel know of a certainty that this Jesus, whom you crucified, is both Lord and Messiah. You think that was uh, startling news to the people that were listening to that presentation, yes or no? I mean, he could not have been bolder. <laughs> Therefore, let all the house of Israel know that you killed the Messiah. They realize, obviously, in that moment, as the Holy Spirit just pours and sweeps into their hearts that their lives and their plan of action in crucifying Jesus of Nazareth 50 days before, that that decision was radically out of harmony with God's revealed will. That they are personally culpable in the death of God's own Son. Now, what do you, what do you think? Just, just venture a guess with me, if you would. Hazard a guess. What do you think their immediate knee-jerk response is? What do you think they're going to say? Just take a guess. Exactly right. Take a look at it there in verse 37. Now, when they heard this, heard what? Heard that they had killed the Messiah, the one that the Jews had been looking forward to with hopeful expectancy for more than 1,200 years, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. That's another way of saying that they were absolutely devastated. When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, obviously, obviously by implication, what they're saying is, what should we do in order to make this what? Right. In each of these three scriptural vignettes, John the Baptist preaching there uh, on the banks of the Jordan River, Saul on the road to Damascus, and here with Peter on the day of Pentecost, in every instance, the people there found out in a moment that their lives were radically out of harmony with God's revealed will, and in each instance, their response was the same. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Why do they say that? I'll tell you why. Because it is built into the very fiber and the very fabric of who and what you are as a person. That when you realize your life is out of harmony with God's revealed will, your immediate, instantaneous, knee-jerk response is to want to do something to make it right. Are we all together, everyone? Yes or no? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? When we sense that God is displeased with our lifestyle or our actions or our choices, we say, God, I want to do something about it. Just show me what to do. What's our presentation entitled? Do. do. You're right. So then, imagine with me that on this side of the platform, we are going to place every single non-Christian religion. Every single non-Christian religion is on this side of the platform, okay? And then over here is Christianity, okay? So over here, we have Hinduism, we have Buddhism, though Buddhism is more of an atheistic philosophy, but for the purposes that we have tonight, we'll say Buddhism is here, and Islam is here, and Judaism is here, and Taoism is here, and animism is here. It's all over here. All non-Christian religions, we're just going to lump over here. Now, by doing this, we are not saying, incidentally, that they are all the same, 
We, we don't want to be uh, uh, overgeneralizing here. We don't want to be stereotypical. We realize that there are radical, significant, and substantive differences in these various religions. But what I'm going to show you tonight is there is a single scarlet thread that runs through every single one of these religions. So over here, all of the non-Christian religions, and over here is what, everyone? The Christian faith. Okay, this is the Christian faith over here. Now, what is it at the most fundamental, elemental core that separates that from that? What is it? Several years ago, I saw a video. You've probably seen videos similar to it. And uh, this was a video where, where devotees of a certain religion that will remain for our purposes tonight, unnamed, were making their way on a spiritual pilgrimage. And they were walking, I don't remember exactly how far it was, it was traditional, oh, the better part of several miles. And uh, as they were walking, it was just the men, they would take every step, they were clothed just in kind of a loincloth, uh, they, they, no, no shirt on, and uh, every step they would take, they had a, it could be a leather uh, strip or it could be a, a, some sort of a knife with, with, on a little bit of a chain or a, a something like that. And they would take a step and they would then whip themselves either around their legs or over their back. Every step. So they'd take a step and whip themselves on the back. Hard. Then take another step and they'd whip themselves here. Take another step, whip themselves on the inside of the thighs. By the time they finally arrived at the place where they were going to offer their oblations and their devotions, they were bloody, frothing messes, many of whom had passed out. Perhaps some had even died in this uh, rigorous ceremony as they were making their way, making their way, making their way, dehydration, blood loss, etc. And, and I looked at that thing and I thought, why are the Why? I'll tell you exactly why. They are going to do something that will cause their God to look down upon them with favor and say, wow, look at their devotion. Look at, look at how they uh, uh, prostrate themselves. Look at how they even flagellate themselves in my name. I am so happy with them and with what they're doing. So to make it even easier and shorter, what they're basically doing is they're saying, I am going to appease God by my actions. Look at how austere I am. Look at how devoted I am. I am going to show, and by the way, their devotion in many instances is admirable. Not the object of their devotion, but their devotion. If you understand what I'm saying, say amen. No question about that. The point is, is they're going to do something to make their God happy. Martin Luther, let's go there. Martin Luther would spend hours upon hours scrubbing the floors of the monastery wall, scrubbing, scrubbing. Why? Because they were dirty? Not so much that. He was, he was trying to do something to so humiliate himself, to so condescend that God looked down and say, look at that sinner. I mean, look at the way he applies himself. He would walk upstairs on his knees. What's he doing? He's trying to appease God. There is a cardinal, elemental, fundamental truth, a scarlet thread that separates every one of these from this. And so you don't have to take my word for it. I'd like to read it to you from The Desire of Ages. It's an old book. You've probably never heard of it. <laughs> Desire of Ages, page 35. Listen carefully, very carefully. Through heathenism, Satan had for ages turned men away from God. So far, so good. Through heathenism, we can understand this, through heathenism, Satan had for ages turned the minds of people away from God. But he won his greatest triumph in perverting the faith of Israel. That's really where he won the battle, was when he perverted the faith of Israel. By contemplating and worshiping their own conceptions, the heathen had lost a knowledge of God and had become more and more corrupt. So it was with Israel. Now follow carefully. The principle that man can save himself by his own works lays at the foundation of every heathen religion. Did you hear that? What principle lays at the foundation of every heathen religion? The principle that man can save himself by his own what? Works. Continue on. It had now become a principle, are you ready for this? Of the Jewish religion. Satan had implanted this principle. 
My lovely wife is sitting right over here. As I told you last night, I waited a full six weeks before I asked her to marry me. It was, it was a decision not to be rushed. It was a decision to be thoughtfully and, and meditatively mulled over, and so I waited a full six weeks. I was prepared to do it within the first six hours, so you can appreciate my patience and my long suffering. <clears throat> now, as you can probably imagine, there were a few things that I didn't learn about in those introductory six weeks. <sighs> I think the A students are all sitting over here. I'm sorry about that. I just, I just feel like they're getting it more. Um, one of those things was that she doesn't like garlic and onions. Okay, now, I'm not saying that that would have been a deal breaker. Okay, but it, it, it might have pushed it back to seven weeks. I mean, it's possible. <laughs> I, I, I love garlic and onions. Anyone here want to say amen? I, I'm just a, I, 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 and by the way, I've tried it all. I say, sweetie, it's so good for you. She's just unconvinced, okay? Now, if you think I'm vigorous about this, my wife's mother, I think she has, you know, my, my wife has uh, two brothers, two sisters, and uh, I think that my wife's mother, Maria, believes that there is maybe something wrong with Violetta because she's Romanian. I mean, she, she doesn't like garlic and onions. There's something wrong here. And so what she will sometimes do, I've seen her do it on a number of occasions, she will prepare a dish, she makes the most marvelous food, and she'll, she'll sneak away into a clandestine corner of the kitchen, and she will begin to chop up um, garlic and or onions or mushrooms. I forgot to mention mushrooms. Uh, but mushrooms would not have been a deal breaker with me. And she'll chop these things up, I mean, just into almost, you know, almost sub-microscopic bits. And uh, what she'll do is she will then implant them into the dish, right? And she'll serve it, and, and I tell you, mother in law is the cutest thing you've ever seen. She, she's, about, she's about that tall. She has the roundest, most beautiful face. She's just a picture of innocence and cuteness. She's just, <laughs> Okay, so you know, you'd never think that she was, you know, clever, like going to trick, you know. So she, what she'll do is she'll take this stuff and she'll sneak it into the dish. She sneaks it in. Now, she thinks she's chopped it up so small that vi it's not gonna, the violet is not going to notice it. And then at the end of the day, she can say, aha, you liked it. There was all kinds of garlic or whatever in that. But <laughs> invariably, what happens is, you know, we sit down, we pray for the food. So, so Violetta will say, Mom? She knows immediately. It's just amazing. She, yeah, Mom, did, did, did you put garlic in this? And she said, <laughs> <laughs> she, 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 it, it doesn't work. I mean, you just can't do it. I've been there. You just can't. It, it's like the Pentagon. You just can't get it in there, right? It's just top secret. Well, listen. That is what Satan did with this principle that is the foundation of all heathen religions. You see, the principle that lays the foundation of all heathen religions is the principle that man can save himself by his own what? Works. Now notice what she says there in that statement. She says that, that the devil had been using one of the most important tools in his toolbox, aha, heathenism, to be turning the minds of people away for centuries upon centuries upon centuries. But he won his greatest triumph, not through heathenism, but when he took that principle and he implanted it in Israel. If anyone should have known the great truths of righteousness by faith, it was Israel. They had the whole sanctuary service that was righteousness by faith, by faith, by faith in the Lamb and the Lamb and the priest and the priest. And the whole thing was righteousness by faith. And somehow Satan amazingly, supernaturally implanted this principle so that when Jesus shows up on the scene, the Pharisees believe that they are going to be saved by their rigorous adherence to the Mosaic law. He had implanted this principle. It's at the foundation of all of that. And worse yet, it caters exactly to your carnal nature. See, your carnal nature, and, and frankly, my nature, the moment that I learn that God is upset, the moment that I learn that God is offended, the moment that I learn that my life is radically out of harmony with God's revealed will, my knee-jerk response is, what shall I do I'm going to do something to make God happy. I'm going to do something to make God love me. I'm going to do something. And God is going to look down and he's going to say, Whoo, that's one of my guys right there. Look at David Ashry. He's powerful. He's awesome. He's what? 
The principle that man can save himself by his own works is the scarlet thread that runs through every single one of these faiths. The Christian faith is different. The core of the Christian faith is that you can't do anything. You're dust. You're dirty dust. <laughs> what, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to appease an infinitely holy, infinitely righteous, infinitely existent God? What are you going to do? Give me a break. You, you don't serve a little statue, beloved. Amen. You serve the invisible, omnipotent, omnibenevolent God of the universe. What are you going to do? Well, there is one thing you can do. Open your Bible to John chapter 6. John what chapter, everyone? John chapter 6. So uh, Jesus has an encounter here. We'll pick it up in verse 25. You know the story. The day before, Jesus had fed the 5,000 with the loaves and fishes, right? Remember the story, everyone? Yes or no? Okay, he fed the 5,000 with the loaves and the fishes, and, and so he must have made some very good sandwiches that day because people were so enthusiastic about, you know, Jesus' sandwiches that they actually walked all the way around the lake to get some more. That's, that's true story. It's biblical. And, uh, and, and they pretended like they, they just happened to circumstantially, serendipitously, oh, 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 look. Oh, it's, it's Jesus. Oh, oh, you know, you, oh, you walk that way and we walk this way, right? So we pick it up in verse 25, John chapter 6, verse 25. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Oh, oh, Rabbi, oh, when did you come here? And Jesus knows what they're up to. Verse 26, Jesus answered and said unto them, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the what? The loaves and you were, I know what you're looking for, you're hungry. You want another sandwich. Verse 27. <laughs> Follow this through. Verse 27. Notice what Jesus says. Do not labor for the food which perishes. Stop working for the food that perishes. But for the food which endures to everlasting what? Life. Which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set His seal on it. Do these people instantaneously know that Jesus is on to them? Yes or no? I mean, they're having the same experience here that, that the people there on the banks of the River Jordan had, that uh, Saul had on the road to Damascus, and that the people did on the day of Pentecost. They, they're pretending like they just, you know, serendipitously ran into Jesus, and Jesus says, I know what you're looking for, and don't play games. By the way, it's very interesting. Many times in the Bible, you find Jesus actually discouraging the crowds from following him. Jesus would rather have 12 people that were worshiping him in spirit and in truth than 12,000 that were worshiping him in error. Jesus is not about numbers as such. He is more about quantity than, or quality rather than quantity. Jesus could have had all the followers he'd wanted. He could have wowed them with some supernatural magic show. So they come on the other side of the, the, the lake there and they oh, Jesus, oh, look, oh, wow, amazing. Hey, do you got any more of those, those sandwiches? And Jesus says, I know what you're looking for. And stop caring and laboring for the food that perishes. What you really need is the food that endures to everlasting life. And I'm going to give it to you. And the people suddenly say, oh, he's on to us. He knows. The Spirit of God has pierced their heart. And they, they know they're standing in the presence of somebody who can read their very motives, their very thoughts. <coughs> what do you think? What, what do you just think they might say? What do, what do you think they just might say? Help me out here. You're exactly right. You're a smart bunch, especially this group over here. Look at what they say. <laughs> Verse 28. They said to him, what shall we, let's all say it together, do that we may work the works of God? In other words, wow, Jesus, we can tell that God is happy with you. What can we do to work the works of God? We want God to be pleased with, pleased with us just like he's pleased with you. We want God to manifest himself in us just like he manifests himself in you. Jesus, what can we do? Are you ready for Jesus' answer? 
I guarantee you that there are people in this room who are not ready for Jesus' answer. What did Jesus say when they asked that question? Jesus, what do we do? That we, we want to make God happy. We, we realize that you're on to us. We realize that we're really following you because of the sandwiches. I mean, what, what can we do? What can we do to work the marvelous works of God? Verse 29, are you ready for this? I hope and pray you're ready. God have mercy. Here we go, verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God. Drum roll, please, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. Believe! You want to make God happy? You want to work the works of God? You want to make your life right with God? Believe! Well, that sounds just like what Jesus said to Nicodemus, doesn't it? Nicodemus, I know you're having trouble grasping this, but please listen to me carefully. For God so loved the world, Nicodemus, that He gave His only begotten Son, Nicodemus, that who... So ever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That sounds just like the Apostle Paul, the great preacher of grace. He said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. They said, what do we do? We want to work the works of God. What can we do? And Jesus said, this is the work of God. Here it is. Believe on Him whom He has sent. Beloved, here is the bottom line core of what separates all of this from this. Over there, I'm going to do something that is going to make God happy. I'm going to do something to appease God. I'm going to do something in order to put my life right with God. Something I do is going to cause God to look down upon me and say, Wow, that David is something. He's got his act together over here. But over here, the great truth of the gospel is you can't do anything. God had to do it. You were in such a pickle, you couldn't even lift your head off of the pillow. You were stuck. You can't do anything to appease God. He's infinitely holy. He's infinitely awesome. He's infinitely righteous. And you're dirty dust. So God looked down. And God said, I want to rescue those people who are in a bad way. But I cannot compromise the principles of my law, for it is the very foundation and essence of my character. How can I exercise both justice and mercy? And then he looks to Jesus. And they have that counsel that Ellen White talks about in early writings, and they discuss there's only one way, and Jesus comes down. And Jesus lives his life as a man. Beloved, I want you to think about that for just a moment. The infinite, eternal, illimitable God of the universe became a man. Now that in and of itself is a condescension that we will never understand properly, not even given eternity. But more than that, he became a man in the likeness of sinful flesh. And then worse than that, he died naked, bruised, beaten, bloodied, battered, and bludgeoned on a tree. And God looks down. And God says, now I can accept that. You believe in what God has done. The core of the Christian faith, beloved is that it is not about what you do, but about your belief in what God has done. Over here, something I do, the core and the center is me. Something I do, I'm going to recommend myself to God. I'm going to do something and God is going to look at me. No, 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 no. Over here, God looks down and He sees His Son and we put our faith in His Son and He accepts His Son and because we put our faith in His Son, we also are accepted in the Beloved. Not on the basis of what we do, but on the basis of what He has done. Amen. Jesus, what do we do? We want to work the works of God too. This is the work of God. Southern Adventist University and visitors, this is the work of God. Believe on Him whom He has sent. Amen. And there's Jesus. 
hanging naked and bloodied on that tree. And you look and you say, that's important. That's very important. It's very solemn. It's very somber. And then in almost the next breath, we'll say, now what do I get to do? <laughs> I'll tell you what you get to do. You get to praise God for what He has done. Amen. What are you going to do? Now, I'm a vegan vegetarian. And I make no apologies for that. <laughs> but sometimes we think to ourselves, you know what? I see what God has done. And it is marvelous. It is awesome. It is important. But you know what? I think I need to spice the mixture up a little bit. I think I need to add in a little of my own righteousness. And, and you know what? I think I'm going to become a vegetarian. I think then God will really be happy with me. And, and he'll look down and he'll say, there's my son and there's David the vegetarian. <laughs> now, beloved, you cannot say, no one in this room can say, oh, he was making fun of health reform. You've got to give me a break. I was a health reformer before I even knew what a health reformer was. I was a vegan before I even knew what a Seventh-day Adventist was. Listen, I believe in, in eating right and living right and being happy and healthy. Can someone say amen? But I don't think for a moment that my vegetarianism recommends me to a holy God. We say, well, I'm going to keep the Sabbath. Well, good for you. You should keep the Sabbath. And I mean keep the Sabbath in spirit and in truth. Not just go to church Sabbath morning and then go home and take a nap. <laughs> or, worse yet, is he really going to say this? Go to church and then go out to a restaurant and call that Sabbath keeping. Amen. So, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to, oh, yeah, well, we'll meet you at TGI Fridays. Yeah, we're going to keep the Sabbath at TGI Fridays. Listen, let, let's, just, let's just be crystal clear about something. You are not keeping the Sabbath if you are eating at TGI Fridays Amen. on the Sabbath. Okay? Because there's this little thing in the commandment that says that you don't work and your son doesn't work and your daughter doesn't work and you're, you know, nobody and the stranger that is within your gates, they don't work either. Amen. You know what that means, the stranger that is within your gates? It, it doesn't mean that if no one's in your gates, you can cause all the people outside to work. What it means is... <laughs> right? So, 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 so the ladies, the ladies are thinking... Hmm, I really need my lawn mowed. So tonight I'll have my husband sleep outside of the gates so tomorrow on the Sabbath he can mow the lawn. <laughs> Beloved, what it means is those people that you have influence over, that your sphere of influence, why would you cause other people to work on the day that you're taking as a day? And you hear some people say, oh, but they're going to work anyway. Oh, well, they're already going to work. I mean, they're already working, and uh, it's so much easier for me. Well, let me tell you something. Let's follow that to its logical conclusion. Thieves are going to steal whether or not you buy stolen goods. <laughs> yes or no? Come on. So you say, what? Well, I didn't tell him to steal. I just purchased the DVD player for $50. <laughs> uh, is anybody going to be comfortable with that? Yes or no? Beloved, listen to me. We should be keeping God's holy Sabbath not as a legalistic requirement, but out of a love relationship for what He has done. Amen? Amen. Your Sabbath keeping, even if it's done correctly, even if it's done in spirit and in truth, does not recommend you to God. It is a love response to God. Amen. All right, so let's wrap all this up here. Do. What should we do? What should we do? What should we do? Built into the very fiber and fabric of humanity. I'm going to do something. God's going to be happy with me. And, and he's going to look down. He's going to think, wow, he's really... Open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Let's wrap this up. Philippians chapter 3. You can do something. You can believe on Him whom He has sent. Philippians chapter 3. Who wrote the book of Philippians? Who was that? Um, that's Paul, that's right. And uh, Paul was concerned. Paul was concerned that, that there were people who were influencing the church at Philippi and they were saying something like this. They were saying, yes, Jesus is important, but you also have to do this and this and this and this. So it's Jesus plus something else that equals salvation. Okay? 
So we pick it up in verse 1, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Look at this. Beware of the mutilation. Uh, that is a pejorative way, a sarcastic way of referring to the Jews. He's talking about circumcision here. He says, beware of those who mutilate themselves. Now, of course, God gave the ordinance of circumcision, but the problem was is that people were now trusting to circumcision. Because remember, the principle that man can save himself by his own works lays at the foundation of every heathen religion, but it had become a principle of the Jewish religion. So they actually started to trust in this ceremony rather than looking through the ceremony at what the ceremony represented on the other side. Beware of the mutilation. You've got to hang in there. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have how much confidence in the flesh? How much confidence? Though I might... Now, Paul here begins to kind of recite, stick out his chest, you know, burst his buttons a little bit. He begins to recite his own spiritual resume. You ready? Here we go. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law, a Pharisee, Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. Paul here says people are coming in and they're telling you, yeah, Christ is good. Yeah, Christ is important. Yeah, righteousness by faith, all of that stuff. But you'd better be circumcised also. So it's Jesus plus my works. And, and, and so Paul says, if, if anybody could boast about what they had done, I could boast more than any of these people that are harassing you. I could boast. And then he recites his spiritual resume. Now, pick it up in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I count but loss for Christ. What, what things is he talking about in context? All of that stuff that he had done before he had a saving relationship with Jesus. He says, but what things were gained to me, those things that I used to trust in. He says, I counted them all but loss when I met Jesus on that Damascus road. Look at it there in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I count but loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. But I press on, if that I may apprehend that, for which also I am apprehended of, Christ Jesus. Brethren, He says, I count not myself to have apprehended. I'm not perfect, but this one thing I do, I forget those things that are behind. In context, what's behind? All of his old works that he used to trust to, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward into those things that are before, I press on toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let's rewind. Let's rewind and go look at a verse there that is so strong so as to almost be unbelievable. Now, I'm reading here from the New King James. I recited there from the King James. But let's look at verse 8. Yet indeed, I also count all things but loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish. Any other versions out there read rubbish? Right? Raise your hand if your Bible says rubbish. Let me tell you, that is rubbish. Because the word is dung. And the translators of the New King James did not want to offend our finer sensibilities. And so they said, you know, rubbish. That's not what Paul said. Paul said, all of that stuff that I was trusting in before I came to faith in Christ, before I realized that it is Jesus' death alone that can recommend me to God, all of that stuff I was trusting in before, he says, it's all dung. You know what dung is? Do you have dung in Tennessee? I'm from Wyoming, and uh, we have lots of dung. We have more dung than people in Wyoming. <laughs> there's, there's dung everywhere. Okay, so you know what dung is, right? Okay. Dung is doo-doo. Okay? So let's put it together then. What's Paul saying? You know what Paul is saying? Paul is saying 
Before I came to faith in Christ, before I realized that the true ground of my acceptance with God is what Jesus has done and not what I do, that the locus of the Christian faith is not with me, it's with God. He said, before I knew that, I was trusting in all of my do, but now I've discovered that my do is doo-doo. You won't forget that one. <laughs> Beloved, Isaiah says our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Notice with me that Isaiah does not say all righteousness is as filthy rags. He said our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You do need a righteousness that will enable you to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. You are going to need that righteousness. But don't trust to your filthy rags. They won't even get you out of the gate. They won't even get your head off the pillow. You are going to need an infinite righteousness. You are going to need a perfect holiness and righteousness. You think, well, where am I ever going to get such a thing? You know where you're going to get it? You're going to get it at the foot of the cross. Amen. When you say, Jesus, I lay all of my due here and I accept what you have done. Amen. The heart and soul of the Christian faith, beloved, is not primarily about what you do, but about what God has done and is doing. Is obedience important? Absolutely, of course. We're going to talk about obedience tomorrow morning. There's no question. Obedience is very important, absolutely important, and even essential. But obedience has to be put in its right context or our do becomes do-do. The message of righteousness by faith is the core of the Seventh-day Adventist message. People were writing to Ellen White and they were saying, Ellen White, uh, the three angels' messages, uh, uh, how does righteousness by faith factor into the three angels' messages? And she wrote back without equivocation and she said, righteousness by faith is the three angels' messages in verity. <laughs> Beloved, the cornerstone of Adventism is not the Sabbath. The Sabbath is an important part. Nobody would, would deny that. The, the core of Seventh-day Adventism is biblical Christianity, and the core of biblical Christianity is faith, trusting God to do what God has said, and trusting and believing that Jesus died for your sins, that His death, His burial, and His resurrection was the death you deserved, was the burial that you deserved, and His resurrection can become your resurrection. Amen. It's a righteousness that you can acquire by believing. And many of our young people, and do not tell me for a moment that I am just whistling Dixie. I've done too many weeks of prayers. I have sat down with too many teary-eyed academy students and too many teary-eyed Adventist young people who, who told me in the plainest language they never understood the principle of righteousness by faith. That is a crime. If our young people are going